Hello and welcome to the first Curious Droid live stream. Now, this is the first time I've ever done a live stream, so if it all falls apart, you know who to blame. Um, now, the subject today is going to be something which I have actually covered before, which is why can't we see the Apollo landers on the moon? Um, now, to help me explain the reason why, um, we have our guest presenter in today, and that is Mark D'Antonio. Um, Dark, hey Mark there. is, yeah, uh, just a quick explanation. Mark's the, the astronomer, the real astronomer here. So he's the one who knows exactly what to, uh, the uh, telescope should be or shouldn't be doing. Also, photo video analyst at MUFON, talking head expert and science advisor on programs in, uh, and channels including CNN, Discovery, Sci Fi, History Channel, National Geographic, and Science Channels. He's also been on NASA's Unexplained Files on the uh, Discovery Channels and What on Earth on the Science Channels. He's also a host of the Sky Tour radio program on KGRA and CEO of FX Models, model making and visual special effects for TV, film and the defence industry. Although I wouldn't imagine the defence industry will need much in the way of special effects for making explosions, would they? Uh, no, that's, that's <laughs> true, but uh, they do need some very special models. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so the, the, you're doing the, like, the prototyping uh, models and things like that? Yes, the engineering models for concepts it'll be like 20 or 30 years out right oh, i said that's very yeah. interesting yeah it is yeah okay right so the uh the order which we'll go is we'll go through the show we'll go through the main topics and then we'll have the uh questions um coming in after the q a session afterwards so if we're not sort of responding to comments and questions during the show that's the reason why we're going to put these to the end we've got a group of moderators which will be collecting the questions um, and then putting them into a document which we can see and then we'll go through those at the end um so really um on to the main topic today, and that is why can't we see uh, the Apollo landers from the moon? Uh, now, I did a video about this about 15 months ago, and there was now 1.3 million views on this, 15,000 comments, and I've been through some of the comments, not all of them, because it's a long read, and there's a lot of people in there who still have um, a bit of a misconception as to why we can't see something on the moon they say well we've got google and they can see things as small as a um a face or, or a book or small object on the on the ground on earth we've got military satellites we've got the uh, very large uh, lsst satellite which is a 3.2 not satellite um telescope with 3.2 gigapixel that's uh, going to be coming online soon why can't any of these and why can't we just swing the hub around so really if we start off and say, well, what are the main problems in seeing something about seven metres across on the moon from the Earth? Well, if you, if you talk about, uh, if you want to talk about the Hubble, for instance, uh, that's a, like an eight foot mirror. It's a you know, 2.4 metre mirror on the Hubble. And when it's looking at something, say, on the moon, Let's talk about just how big an object it can see on the moon. And it, it relates to uh, a limitation of optics, a well-known scientific principle. It's called the Dawes limit, D-A-W-E-S, Dawes limit. You can look it up. And uh, the Dawes limit specifies that you can't see things beyond a certain resolution. It basically is a statement of the resolution for the optical system. So for the Hubble telescope, uh, I wrote a program to calculate you know, uh, how, how much it could see. Basically, the Hubble could see something on the moon that's around, uh, oh, I'd say, uh, I'm looking at here, is uh, 0.048 arc seconds. Now you say, well, what's an arc second? Right. Okay. Actually, we've got a graphic arc up second. here, yeah. Oh, can you just quickly Excellent. show this? Um, that, sure. That is, an arc, is a quick demonstration of an arc second. Um, now, if you look at the, a circle, is 360 degrees. One minute, or one degree of that circle is 60 arc minutes. And then obviously it's like time. It goes down to one arc minute is 60 arc seconds. So right. we're looking at the whole moon here, um, and that is 31 arc minutes, which is about half a degree. Um, so looking at something on the, on the moon the size of the Apollo, you're saying is, what, 0.005 of an arc second. 
Well, that's the resolution of the the the, the, the Hubble has point oh five. Oh arc right, yes, second. yes, yeah, which is ten times 0. worse. Right. Right. It's right. ten times worse. It's ten times too poor. To see resolution. that on there. Right. That's I see. exactly right. Yes. Yes. So. Um, I think we've, uh, we can actually bring in, um, if I just bring up the LRO, uh, another... That's a Lunar Reconnaissance quick, Orbiter, yeah. Yeah, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and this is the, uh, the quick map, and yep. uh, we'll just bring that up here. And you can see this is I the moon. That's pretty obvious, yeah, it's moon. <laughs> um, oh, but that's we can, what it looks like. Yeah, <laughs> God, I always wonder what it's like. Um <laughs> But we can zoom in on here, and yet but you can just about see there's a little red cross here. If I wave my cursor, it will get bigger. I should have actually adjusted this so it stays large. But uh, that's where Apollo 15 is. So imagine if we're going to look at this, we've got to look at that, and they say, right, there's Apollo 15. Let's see how far we've got to go to actually see this. So we keep coming in and in and in. And in, and in. I like this. What yep. is that? Is that a, is that a, uh, like a, a canyon or something at the side? That's a rill. It's a volcanic rill that's near the uh, uh, near the landing spot for the Apollo right. 15. And that must be pretty large. That thing there. How big is that? Uh you know, I actually looked at that. It, I, I don't remember the actual size of the, the rill, uh, but yeah, you're in the LRO, and you can actually measure the size of the LRO. There's tools in there. I'm sorry, right. the, the size of the rill. There's actually yeah. tools for, for which you can use to actually draw a line and calculate, and it shows you the elevation and the curvature. I teach a class on, on how to use right. the quick map, actually. Right, right. right. Uh, and well, we'll, it actually gives you all that data. Right, so we can actually measure that if necessary. I won't go into that now. That's but we'll, correct. We keep, we'll, we'll keep going in, and we keep zooming in, we keep zooming in, and now yeah. we can actually see... There's a little cross. Just below the cross, there's this little blob here. That blob there if i get my mouse to show up a bit bigger the shadow is there and that is the la that is the descent stage of apollo 15 and you can see the tracks right. there are the tracks and then we've got a couple of yeah, experiments no. over here um yep so that's how far we've actually got to go and this is taken from i believe about um 15 miles above the earth with the lro well, above, above the moon, yes, it, you're yes. right. It, 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 uh, th this was a 15-mile uh, high altitude, and they dropped the LRO from a much higher altitude, and they brought it into another orbit so that they could actually image some of these sites. Now, uh, people say, well, they're faked and all that stuff. But you know what? If you take a look at this at various times throughout the, uh, throughout the LRO data, okay, the LRO camera, you know, LROC is the name of the camera, the, LR the LROC, as I call it, the LROC camera, you can actually see these sites under different sunlight. And you can right. see the different elevations yeah. of sunlight. It'd be a vast conspiracy that not only we were in on, but the Russians were in on, the Chinese were in on, the Japanese were in on. And every major country in the world would have to be in on it. And then you have to ask the question, why? What's the end game? Yeah, yeah. You I know? mean, we should There is no end game. Yeah. Uh, I mean, from here, we can actually see the shadow. Um, on one side, so obviously the sun is yeah. shining in this direction and it's illuminating yeah. the uh, the descent stage, and there's the shadow. And like you say, on some of them we can see the flags. You can't see the flag straight down unless you are at an angle, but you can see the yeah. shadow that is cast by the flag, and that varies because as the LRO is running around and around and around, um, we can actually see that change as the lunar day progresses. That's right. In fact, sometimes the shadows are extremely long, all right, when the sun is at low elevation, yeah. and the descent stage will cast a giant shadow, but so too will the flag, and you can actually see the flag and follow the shadow back, uh, the shadow of the flag, and follow it back, and you actually can see the little tiny pinpoint of the actual, it's a slightly grayer, whiter area, which is actually the flag itself, and in a couple of the landing sites, you can actually see the flag, if you can believe it. It's like you know, you, you can't count the stars and stripes, obviously, but you do see the flag itself on, on this flagpole. You certainly can't make it out. It's right at the very limits, even for the LRO camera, you know, 15 right. miles above the moon at that point. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know? if we're comparing, like, the LRO to something on Earth, I mean, the sort of things we've got are the very, the very largest 
telescope, so things like the Keck telescope uh, on yeah. Hawaii, uh, which is what that's a ten meter uh, telescope. Um, yeah. If we people say, well, you should be able to see something uh, with that again. If we looked at the, what we need to calculate the size of that, um, there is actually a calculator uh, available, which we have got, and uh, I think I can find it here. Um, you're, you're talking about calculating the DAWs limit yeah. for Yeah, the DAWs for limit for that. Um, so if we right. just bring up which that again. Which, again, is this the is it. angular resolution. Yeah. yeah. Again, this is the telescope capability. And you can put in the... Aperture of a telescope here, which is um, 8,400. We were doing this for the, that's actually the Hubble size. Um, so the other one would be bigger. And it gives you then the maximum arc second resolution it can pick out. And we were saying before that we need to see 0 0.005 to get any reasonable sort of view of the, um, the landing sites down to uh, something a couple of meters across. So that's right. what we can actually use there um, to actually see that. And in fact, the, the actual number is, it's, you know, for the Keck um, is actually 0 0.0115 if you want to go all the way out to significant figures, so to speak. But, and and it's, it's hopelessly too low in resolution to be able to see anything we've left behind on the moon. Okay. But uh, the, the other issue is that we have the atmosphere. That limit, that Dawes limit that we talked about with that, that calculation you just showed, that limitation is basically for without air. You have to add air and the problems of turbulence in the air into it, and that's yeah, the problem. Yeah. Yes, 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 because obviously we're looking through. And uh, I think you were saying that if you look uh, straight up at the moon, then obviously there's much less air to actually look through. But if you're looking at it at an angle, just like when the moon is rising, you're looking through a lot more um, air and there's going to be a lot more turbulence and distortion, which is going to limit the resolution even more. <clears throat> and change the color. Uh, blue light gets scattered in our atmosphere, which is why we have a blue sky, blue light from the sun, which is basically white. So right. at sunrise, that's why the sun is red, and sunset, that's why it's red. But, and then when the moonrise comes up, you see it's a little orange. Yes. That's the reason. And so we're yes. losing the light, too. Right. So we get, we're losing that as well. So I think we, uh, we, we, we worked out that the, the maximum size for um, a telescope to be able to uh, see uh, what's on the moon at that resolution was around about 100 meters in size now i mean that's a massive mirror to actually make and i mean we, we can't physically make anything that big as a single mirror so it would have to be made of sections but uh, um do you think that there is a possibility at some point in the future that we might be able to have a land-based um telescope which is um that size but using modern technologies <coughs> That's a really good question because any telescopes that are on the planet are, are suffering from gravity. Uh, the gravitational field on the Earth is such that anything you put up that's in a curve looking up in the sky like a curved, say, mirror is trying to sag all the time. It's always trying to sag because the weight of the mirrors uh, and the weight caused by gravity. Now, that mirror system would have to be very structurally sound. And it would most likely have to consist of little tiny mirrors all together, like a, a think about uh, the compound eye of a fly or a bug of some kind, right? That that's that's what you'd have to make, like the Keck telescope, you know, up on Mauna Kea. The Keck has got multiple mirrors for a, a very different reason, and uh, that's to help eliminate the issue of the atmospheric turbulence using a process known as adaptive optics. That's something you'd have to build into your telescope right off the bat so it'll have to be faceted mirrors so that you can actually because the way that works is the adaptive optics the each little facet of the mirror each little mirror moves a slight bit at a very uh, microscopic vibrational frequency so that you can actually uh, get a uh, removal of that atmospheric turbulent cell for instance but it happens as it's happening it's done live so your image comes in uh, far better uh, right off the bat all right, and a large telescope like you're talking about, uh, the best place to build such a thing, and actually wouldn't be on the Earth at all, uh, but up in space. 
Right. Then right. you can make it out of very lightweight materials <coughs> and in you know configure it easier up there. Yeah. So I mean, there's uh, the the large synoptic survey telescope which is going up in Chile. Now this is a 3.2 gigapixel. Now a lot of people have said, well, why don't we just have a really high resolution sensor which will then be able to pick up very much smaller objects? So again, I think there's a, there's a major issue with that, isn't there? Well, there is. I mean, with the, with the gigapixel camera, the problem we have is it's actually looking at nine square degrees of sky. Okay. Now, That's remember, the moon sky. is, it is when the moon is half a degree. Okay. The moon's half a degree in the sky. Okay. So the moon, the area it's looking at is far bigger than the full moon. And now we're asking it to look at an area on the moon that's so small that not even that the LRO can't even see it from a higher altitude. So now you're, you're asking it to do something it wasn't designed to do, and it can't see as well as even the Hubble, for instance. Uh, right, the, the Hubble right. has better resolution than does. This one, you know, the gigapixel camera, it's got lots of pixels, yes. But the size of the image coming in is what matters, and you can't zoom in. Uh, right. Forever into an image, yeah. You, know, yeah, you reach you, that limit too, and that's that's problematic. Yeah. So you're going to end up um, with yes, a very large image, but the the moon and whatever it is going to be is going to be a very small part of it. So you're still no better off. That's right. Yeah. So what In about fact, you're the, worse off? Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, so what about the uh, the James Webb telescope when it eventually gets up there? What about that? I know it's a million miles out, which is actually probably four times further away than the Earth is from the moon, so that's going to be a little bit of an issue. But if they could sort of swing it around, again, that's going to have similar issues, I presume? Oh, yeah, well, I mean, the James Webb won't be able to see anything like that either because it's going to be so far away. Uh, and, and that's the issue we'll have with the James Webb. Now, it it would be a... Uh, a, a very interesting, um, a very interesting thing to, to to try just to see, and we know that James Webb is going to be pointed back at the Earth just to, you know, gauge the resolution and so forth. But the James Webb's instruments are primarily infrared telescopes, so it's going to be uh, uh, used to uh, to see the atmospheres of exoplanets. Exoplanets in astronomy, though, that's my specialty. I, I specialize. Well, I made it my specialty, specializing in, in planets around other stars, right? And yeah, we yeah. have to understand the Earth and the Earth-Moon system uh, and all that that entails to be able to understand uh, other planets and their, their, their very dynamic environments. And so the Webb telescope, good as it is, won't be able to have the, uh, the, the resolution at that scale, at that distance in, uh, primarily. Right, right. Yeah. So It's um, a six and a, six and a half meter uh, mirror, by the way, just, just to clarify that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not that big because I say we're looking at a much bigger on Earth yeah. to go two hundred fifty thousand miles. Now, I mean, people say, well, we've got Google. Google can see something which is the size of, um, I think it's about uh, five centimeters, uh, maybe something, maybe a little bit bigger than that. From, but that's from two hundred and fifty miles up. The Earth right. is 238,000 miles from the moon. So we're talking yeah. a thousand times further away. So even technology, which is ex which we think is very good at looking down on us and uh, in theory could see something maybe like a number plate. Um, when you pull that out and say, OK, then we'll, we'll put the... Uh, these fantastic military spy satellites somewhere near the moon and then look back at the Earth and try and see something which is four metres across, you'd probably be lucky to see something the size of a city block. Yeah, I, I mean, you have to look at, you have to look at all, the, all the parameters of the telescope and, and not to forget that uh, you can't escape the limitation of the optics. And that's the biggest thing, right? Yep. So, so so we are we are really stuck. So um, we're getting to the point where the only way we can actually see anything on the moon is with the LRO, and that's mapped the whole of the moon now, hasn't it? It's gone round um, numerous times, and it mapped it in quite high resolution. So yeah. is there actually? I mean. Is there actually a reason why we would build a large telescope? I know we're not going to build one just to prove people uh, that the, the things are actually there. <laughs> It'd be a rather expensive way of trying to prove it. They, but uh, they'd like that, wouldn't they? 
Oh, they'd love to, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but even then, they'd probably say it was photoshopped in anyway. So, um, yeah. But so with the LRO now, um, that seems to have sort of uh, dismissed most of these um, theories that it wasn't there because of the way the thing has been um, photographed and it's photographed from different angles and different options. You'd have to do an awful lot of uh, work there to try and cover that up and make it so that it, it was, if it was a fake, it's an awful lot of work to do. Oh, that, that's so true. And, you know, the LRO has mapped the lunar surface down to a half a meter per camera pixel, a sensor pixel on the camera. So that means that you can see a, a large boulder, you know, easily on the on the moon. When I say boulder, I mean something that may be just a, 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 a couple meters across. You're going to actually see it very clearly in terms of, uh, you know, light and dark in terms of the spot. Because remember, a pixel on the camera sensor is only one color. But you'll see that it's a lighter color. I mean, so clearly, if there's a boulder half a meter in size, it's going to take up a pixel on the camera yeah, sensor. Yeah. Now, that if you just look at what a half a meter is, that's that's not very many. You know, that's not not very many centimeters. That's that's you know very small. Yeah. Okay. So I think that uh, you know, the the LRO's capability to have mapped all the moon, which it has, uh, and the poles, by the way, as well. The only thing we can't see with the LRO, uh, with the visible light part, actually, is the interior of the shaded craters that are always in shadow. Uh, there's the north and south poles. There's craters that actually have permanent shadows. Uh, in fact, that's the place where we originally we thought that they would uh, have uh, water, you know, that might be usable for like a moon base. Right. However, it turns out that the, there's water all over the moon, as it turns out. So that 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 point is no longer viable and that means we're not restricted say to right. be building a moon base on just the south pole near cabius crater where the they, the yeah. l-cross mission uh, had the uh, the impact yeah uh, in fact if we bring up the uh, image here this is the um apollo 11 landing site and this was done in fact if you can actually see the bottom of it, it says apollo landing site captured from 24 kilometers 15 miles above the earth by the uh, yeah. lro by, and by it's been moon. marked marked on yeah. there and we've got the, the, la the lunar lander, and you can actually just make out, I don't know if you can see it on there, but you can just make out the, the landing pads, three of them. One of them is in That's shade. Right. Um, you can see the LRO. Now, that's the uh, the, Lu the uh, laser reflector, which I believe um, you had uh, some, uh, not dealings with, but your university was involved with that. In fact, it was. Uh, when I got my degree in astronomy, one of the things that... Um, was there in a glass case was the uh, the lunar uh, retro reflector array. And I was like, oh, what's that doing here? And I talked to the engineering guys in the uh, in what they call the physical plant, the place where they actually made these things. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, we built those for the lunar project, for the uh, Apollo project. I was like, wow, that's really cool. So they had a part in design and, and engineering of that, that array, uh, which uh, the, the, each of those little tiny circles on these retro reflector arrays, if you look it up, uh, each of those is what's called a corner reflector. It actually reflects light back to it from almost any direction light hits it. So right from the side, it'll reflect light right back in the same direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah you've there got you a couple. Go. You've got a couple yeah. here on Google. Um, that's beautiful. Yeah, and so that's and the actual. If you look at those. There. Yeah, and, and those those reflectors would actually reflect back the light, so that for instance, if you shine a laser from uh, a very powerful laser, yeah, usually like an argon or something that can get through the atmosphere without with, with less loss. When you shine that at the moon, you get a reflection off of that retro reflector array that you'll see. Now, the beam gets wider as it gets farther away from the Earth, hits the moon and reflects, it comes back wide. You get a very narrow, uh, sorry, a very, uh, uh, so we say, diminished reflection back from the moon. But you get a, you get a reflection because the moon doesn't generally give off, uh, you know, uh, light in the green section of the spectrum where the laser is, you know. So right. you know it's the laser coming back, and you time it, and you actually get an accurate portrayal of the distance of the moon. And it's through that experiment we discovered the moon's actually going away from the planet by about two centimeters a year, how, which is kind of interesting. How accurate is uh, that um, that distance measuring? You're saying it's two, they can measure it, and it's two centimeters a year. It's actually moving with. How accurate is uh, that to... Gosh, within millimeters, I would have thought something like that. 
Yeah, it's it's very accurate. It it, it can actually see uh, several significant figures. So you know when you have like a number point and then you know the figures after are the significant figures, you can measure that down to several uh, three, four, five uh, significant figures because you're you're, well, you're measuring of, of a millimeter. Uh, Oh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, whatever your units are, right, you know, yes. you can actually get now the millimeters, of course, smaller units than an inch, obviously. But yeah. uh, when you talk about uh, millimeters, it'll be a, a fraction uh, of a millimeter that it can be measured by. And, and that's just the quality of your measuring equipment. It has nothing to do with the with anything about the distance and, and the, where the reflectors are placed on the moon. It has everything to do with the quality of your measuring equipment back here on Earth. So yeah. if we have a good quality equipment, you get a good quality measurement. Yeah, and that's going to rely down to extremely high quality timing. So, because you've got to measure a very, very small amount uh, of time for it going. I mean, it takes about a second, uh, just over a second to get there and a second to get back. But it's that very, very accurate timing which will give you the the, uh, the accuracy there. That's right, and it's light, so we know the speed of light. We know how fast it takes to get there and and back. And all we have to do is measure that time, and we can figure it out based on the speed of light and right. we know the distance and it's a, yeah. it's only as accurate as of course our measurement of the speed of light as well yeah. so uh we have that to uh, quite a number of significant figures but you know uh, who knows there yeah. might be a way that we're wrong completely <laughs> wrong but i can tell you this um you know the, the 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 people that go down the flat earth crowd line which i never thought i'd have to deal with as an astronomer yeah. okay in real life uh, you know, they say that the moon's only a few thousand miles away, as is the sun. It's like, wow, hey, make that work. You just can't do it, you know. So, uh, you know, the retroreflector experiment proves that. But, uh, you know, facts, they get in the way of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I was about to say, the retroreflector is there. It is something which is actively working. So unless uh, aliens planted it there and we never actually went to the moon, then we must have had some hand in actually getting the thing up on the surface. Well, the first time that someone uh, gets a high wattage laser with a high wattage or, or high uh, quality receiver and beams that laser at the moon and does their own timing uh, as a professional amateur, so to speak, you have to have some pretty hefty equipment to do this, uh, and they see that they're getting a reflection from the moon, then they will, uh, then they'll have to explain why they're getting this reflection from this object that's supposedly only a couple thousand miles away. And, and then they have to say, well, is the speed of light wrong? And then they have to address every other problem that would have, you know, come into play if they tried to go down that path. And I, frankly, would just love to see them spin their wheels and go right ahead and do that. I'll wait. I'll wait over here. I'll just wait back here while you do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Right. So um, now then, if we look at some of the questions that are coming in, we've got some from our Patreon uh, group. Um, yeah. Uh, Marco Jungbluff, uh, the moon is getting hit by asteroids uh, all the time, so how high is the chance of one hitting the Apollo landing, uh, a lander? That's a good question. I mean, um, in I mean, the I early that, era... Yeah? I, I, I was thinking, but I mean, they, I'm assuming that micrometeorites are hitting the things all the time, but they're not going to be the sort of large size, are they? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly sure that you know we would notice the big object impacting the moon these days. Um, but see, in the era of bombardment, you know, 3.8 billion years ago, uh, we the moon was being pounded all the time by debris left over in the solar system. Now that era of bombardment subsided, and then the moon was hit by other, uh, you know, impacts over time. But then. Uh, it's settled into this phase where we are now, where most of the debris has been removed from the inner solar system by the moon, the Earth, other planets, Jupiter especially. And now we have a relatively clear solar system. So as far as micrometeorites, you're right. Micrometeorites, uh, they hit the ISS. You know, they hit the space shuttle. Um, there was actually, there's a photo online of the of the windshield of the space shuttle that actually shows a micrometeorite uh, scar. Yeah, where the, it the cupola window, yes, yes. Yes, Right, so that's on the ISS, right? But you can actually yeah. see on the space shuttle itself there was one that impacted. So, you know, they're always around, and, and micrometeorites are small, tiny, smaller than a grain of sand. But their power is in their speed. You know, their speed and their impact speed is very high. So 
that makes them dangerous to some extent. If they hit you in a spacesuit, well, that could be fatal. All right, it'd go through you like a bullet, you know. But if we look at the landers in that spot, uh, that's really such a small, uh, a small aspect ratio uh, of its its size versus the overall size of the moon that it's sitting on. So, is there a chance? There's absolutely a chance, but not really for a large asteroid. Large asteroids are very, very rare uh, in this area. We we actually have. Uh, maybe 10 a year that go near the Earth, which means farther from the moon than we are. Okay, Those are uh, sometimes the Earth-crossing asteroids. We have another group of asteroids that's 60 degrees ahead of our orbit and 60 degrees behind our orbit. And those are just always following us. And those are actually in a stable location. So the chances of those breaking away, uh, it'd have to be some kind of catastrophic event. Uh, but we'd probably have noticed what caused the catastrophe long before we care about what hits the lunar lander modules on the moon. Uh, yeah, I'd so, imagine so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I'd say that right now that the best chance of the, the landers getting hit by anything might be from, say, uh, a piece of debris, um, maybe, maybe the size of a pea or a grain of sand. Uh, and, and a pea would even be uh, somewhat rare. But we have seen impacts on the moon. In fact, uh, at least one was caught live. And you actually see... A little bright spot, bink, and it appears and goes away. And that bright spot uh, yes. is, right, remember that? The, the bright spot is that energy being released because energy can't be created or destroyed. It just gets transformed so that that kinetic energy of motion gets converted to heat uh, when it right. hits the, the, the lunar surface. And uh, you see that bright light in that yeah. moment when it's being vaporized. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. Yeah. And, of course, there is no atmosphere on the moon. So uh, we've, we've, there's nothing to slow it down, not like coming into the Earth where it's going to get hit in the atmosphere and then burn up. It's going to be still travelling at 17,000 miles an hour or whatever speed when it actually hits right, the moon. That's, right. going to make, that's going to make a hole in something, uh, either a lander or a person or something like that, but yes. So now then, second question. Um, are there any international laws protecting the Apollo landing sites um, because of the extreme conditions? What would the stores of fuel and cryogenics be possible? Actually, that was quite interesting. Last week, I saw an article which had been released by the US government and uh, NASA, and they were talking about um, restricting access to the uh, NASA sites because obviously we're getting to a stage now where we will have in the next 10 years or so uh, the good possibility that people will be back on the moon and it isn't going to be the Americans it's going to be the Russians or the Chinese and there's uh, probably going to be some uh, pressure or interest to sort of go near the Apollo landing sites and they were saying that they want to preserve these for uh, scientific interest and also it's a piece of history it's one of the most important pieces of history we have and if someone were to land nearby first of all there's the effect of the dust that blows up if you were to when apollo 12 landed um it landed near um one of the surveyor i think it was surveyor nine surveyor three like. i believe oh, it was or three yeah oh, okay um, maybe it was i'm not quite sure but it landed near surveyor and they, uh, and they took back the camera uh, they wanted to see how it had fared and a few other bits um up for a couple of years out on the moon and when they brought them back under examination they found it had had like a sandblasting effect and they wondered what it was and uh, they figured out that it was the ex the exhaust blown out from the rocket as it let the descender as it landed it accelerated the the dust to uh, incredible speeds. In fact, they said that the very smallest amounts had been accelerated to a speed where they could effectively virtually reach orbit. And because there's no atmosphere, there's nothing to slow them down. So they just go, and with weak gravity, they're just gonna they're gonna gradually fall back to the, the lunar surface. But it's just gonna go and go and go and go. And they yeah. said that this this effect, if someone were to land nearby could then damage the spacecraft. There's also the, um, the fact that if when someone goes up and walks up to the lander to make an examination of it, they're going to leave tracks in the lunar regolith, the soil. And those and tracks, step over existing tracks. Exactly. And those don't get washed away like they do in Earth, uh, on Earth where you've got wind and erosion and rain. They will stay there. So the original tracks will then be contaminated by somebody else's 
tracks as they walk up to and do whatever. And you can also right. imagine that if at some point in the future private uh, enterprises will go there, someone getting a bit of um, Apollo 11, 12, <laughs> 14, 15 or 17 and bringing it back, how much that would be worth to a collector. It would be astronomical. It'd be the most... It'd be the most, oh, that's a pun. It'd be the most <laughs> expensive thing on eBay. <laughs> you know? Exactly, you know? yeah. Just like so, if someone could get a hold of Elon Musk's Roadster and, and get a piece of uh, Starman, you know, the astronaut that's in the driver's seat, that would end up being a very, very uh, expensive uh, eBay auction. Yeah. So so, so um, they are actually working on this now. And I, 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 I've forgotten where the ethics thing was, but if you look it up, um, it was only a document released, I think, about 10 days ago. Um, and they're just now sort of saying, well, that... But, 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 but the other interesting thing that brings up is then, but if you start to say, well, okay, then, um, we're going to restrict access to the US sites, which is the, the, the Apollo sites. Uh, then we've got the Chinese with the Jade Rabbit. They've got their site. And we've also got the Russians with various sites, like the Zond, uh, Landers, the Lunar Hods, um, those things. The rabbit for China. Yeah. But you start then to say, well, okay then, who owns that bit of land on the moon? Whose is that territory where you can say you can't go there because that's got an American uh, piece of space equipment on it or a Russian piece of space equipment? You then start to... Oh, that's right. You start to then uh, make the moon uh, a territory of some a country back on the Earth, which is, again, what we've done... Uh, we try to avoid at Antarctica. It, it, it has actually been split up. But I think to international treaties, the moon doesn't belong to anyone, if, 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 if I'm correct on that. Yeah, right now that's that's very true. But um, see, with the privatization of space, that's bound to happen because that's you know countries can go broke trying to explore space. Private companies do it for profit. Uh, and when private companies start doing exploration, they're going to demand that they have areas of the of moon or Mars or some of these asteroids that are easier to get to uh, or other planets that are theirs and theirs alone. This will happen because this is how corporations work. But it, it'll have to be bef at a time when, when the presence of mankind, humankind, out at these locations is really, really dense. We're going to have to have a lot of, a lot of the density of, of these corporations' presence out there for them to start drawing borders. But it's it's natural for us to draw borders. And so I don't think we're going to get away from that. But, you know, perhaps we can actually use it to our advantage uh, when we enforce, you know, rules and say that the, these, these different corporations have to, within their zone, they have to maintain a certain level of preservation for anything that is historical importance in that zone. Right, yes, yes. Um, and I suppose you'll have um, exclusive, uh, the, the, the companies will want something like exclusive mining rights saying, well, uh, we're going to send right. up a rocket which is going to cost us X billion pounds and, a, and uh, the equipment as well. We want to say we're going to have this piece of the moon to ourselves. We don't want somebody else moving in there because it might be mineral rich, which actually leads us on to the next question, um, which is, does anyone know... How much of the moon is covered by precious metals? This is by uh, Space uh, Ventures Investors. In fact, the last question was by Michael Wilde. I forgot to, uh, forgot to mention that, sorry. Uh, but Space Ventures, uh, Space Ventures Investors says, um, does anyone know how much of the moon is covered by precious metals? And uh, have the space agencies tried to detect this kind of deposit or are they only interested in water? Well, obviously water is useful for fuel to get there and back and uh, for, for humans to drink and uh, say to convert into fuel. Uh, but yeah. if we're going to be going mining, it's going to be after something which is expensive and rare on this, on this planet, uh, but we can get there and it's going to be worth bringing back. Yeah, and, and I, I agree with that 100%. And the trouble is, if we go to mine the moon, uh, again, it's going to be like, here, we have to stake a claim and make sure no one jumps the claim, so to speak. This will only happen at the point where we're actually in a position to have multiple corporations near each other on the moon. Now, are, is the moon covered with precious metals? Probably not covered with precious metals, but there, it's gonna there's going to be, within the rock strata below the regolith, that, that layer of just, you know, powdery uh, surface material, which is actually like glass. It's very sharp. 
So yeah, you have to really have a strong spacesuit. The, the Apollo astronaut spacesuits got torn right to the insulation uh, in some cases, and they couldn't go out and do their final spacewalk, like I think it was Harrison Schmidt. But anyway, um, the, the metals are going to be in rock layers below the surface of the moon, and they're going to have to be mined in the same way that we mine here. So there's going to be quite a presence on the moon for of, of mining uh, and miner presence to actually get this material out. Now, the Earth and the moon are a similar composition, and that similar composition means that as we see gold here on the Earth, it's in little veins. Well, maybe there's something like that on the moon. You know, we don't know specifically because we can't really see directly into the moon, uh, except with, uh, you know, seismic surveys. They, they let us know about the core of the moon and whether it's still molten a little bit. Okay, so uh, they tell us some things, but they don't tell us all the details of, like, the geology. But we can see by looking at the surface of the moon and mapping it with a spectrometer, we can actually see where these metals that are on the surface uh, exist. Like titanium is on the moon, you know, helium-3 is on the moon. And helium-3 yes, be helium used for three. fusion. That's the fusion. That's what everybody seems to be going on about. The Chinese said they were going to be mining helium-3 on the moon. Yeah, well, or looking again, for they're, anyway. they're looking ahead to the point where we have fusion reactors that supply our energy. And we're not, you know, we may leapfrog that, but we don't know. But the, right now, uh, let's just say it's fusion, right? Well, fusion is going to require certain materials to fuse. What's fusion? Well, smashing two hydrogen atoms together makes helium. Okay, well, that's what happens in the sun. But helium-3 is part of the process in there. And if we actually have helium-3, we have part of the process. We can actually continue the fusion reaction. So it'll be a, a fuel for a nuclear fusion reactor. That's very, very, very common. Did I say very four times? Yeah, it's yeah. very common on the, on the moon. Um, but so is titanium, and so are other metals, and so are other uh, materials that are on there. We don't know the quantities of certain metals. But uh, the spectral results you can get online. You can actually go see them and see with a color map where these different materials are on the moon. But will it actually be viable to get the thing back to Earth in the quantities to offset the cost of getting a, a spacecraft and then all the extraction equipment and the men, even if you're going to, or you're going to do it robotically? That's an awful lot of stuff to get up there, and we see how expensive it is just to launch something. Um, a few tons um so you're going to need i mean you, you things like a cat a caterpillar um bulldozer uh, and then the the diggers to dig a thing out and haul yeah. it around it's all Digging heavy tools, stuff yeah. it's all very heavy stuff so i i makes me wonder it's gonna have to be extremely pure and extremely large amount and of course if they bring a huge amount back then what was rare is no longer rare and then loses its market value Hello, Mark. I don't hear. Yeah, yeah, you were, you, you were, you, you cut out on me for a second. Oh, uh, just, I, just, I, cut out, cut, I cut out just at the point where you're asking the question. Um, yeah, yeah. No, no, I was saying that um, if you were bringing something back which is extremely rare and very expensive right. now, then obviously, um, if you bring a lot of it back, it's no longer as rare, and therefore the uh, the market value of it will will plummet. And therefore, does it make it cost effective? Uh, yeah, I understand that point, but my, my feeling is only if they bring back many millions of tons of this material. But keep in mind that bringing it back means we have to get it to the planet's surface. And we'd have to have a way to do that that doesn't require punching a hole in the atmosphere every time we do it, like when we re-enter. You know? So uh, we punch a hole going out, of course, but we also do that coming back in. Not in the same way, but every time you re-enter the Earth's atmosphere... You know, let's say it was an automated process, okay? These things may be shot with mass drivers off the moon. They shoot packets of material to the Earth where they re-enter on their own and they just land automatically or whatever, okay? Kind of a la the Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX uh, Falcon rockets. Well, that is going to cause problems in our ecosystem, in our environment. So uh, I think that the way that we're going to solve this problem is really by a, a committee of corporations that are going to privatize this process. I don't think the United States as a government entity is going to mine the moon. I just don't. They'll do a base, but why a base? Well, the base would be to establish a human presence to show we can do it, blah, blah, blah. And maybe 
uh, Robert Bigelow's inflatable habitats. I call them inflated tats. Okay, his inflated tats are going to be on the moon to be able to, uh, you know, uh, make these the the housing units or whatever. But these are all just small steps. And you know, if we have a large presence of material up there, and uh, that is to say, equipment, well, that has to come from somewhere, and we had to either make it there, which mm. is probably the likely al alternative. Or we had to bring it there, which is going to be extremely costly. A corporation would probably investigate automated manufacture of the materials necessary, the, the equipment. So if you have something that can land on the moon and actually uh, start creating uh, equipment to mine the moon, that's the best way. When we start going to the asteroids, undoubtedly that's what we're going to do. Right. So you think that uh, asteroids would be easier to do than going to the moon? Uh, maybe, maybe not. The moon is certainly closer. The moon only has one sixth the gravity. Landing on the moon is not as, uh, it, it's problematic, but it's not as problematic as landing on Mars. Okay. Uh, landing on an asteroid is, right? Yeah. Landing on an asteroid is easier, but it's much farther away and it's a moving target. Most times it's a rotating target too. It's actually rotating, uh, you know, on these weird axes, which could be a problem as well. So, there's a lot of considerations to cons you know, to think about, um, but again, I don't. I think that it's probably uh, gonna be a long time before we actually realize the benefits of mining either the moon or the asteroids. It'll be the moon first for sure, right. in my view. Right. Okay, then. Right. We've got our first super chat question coming from James Burns. Thank you very much. Ten dollars there. Um, uh, is a design like the Sea Dragon more viable with today's space exploration in conjunction with 1970s SST systems? Uh, well, the Sea Dragon was the um, brainchild of uh, Truax, Robert Truax, and that was the massive rocket. Um, Very big. Which it, it, I mean, the engine uh, combustion chamber, I think, covered the uh, the, the main. Uh, bottom half of a Saturn V, you could fit that inside the bell, and it would lift a uh, thousand tons, but and it'd be sea launched. And uh, my God, it would be one hell of a sight to see. I don't, I don't know because there isn't anything that's that big that needs lifting into space at the moment. That is the problem. That's what did it for it in the first place. Uh, it was just too big. Um, the it, that was well, meant to be reusable as well. Uh, so they were talking about reusability back in the '60s. Yeah, I mean because we do space travel was uh, expensive. But the other thing that the Sea Dragon is going to do, uh, or would do, is it would actually punch a much bigger hole in the ozone layer uh, than current rockets do when they launch. So you couldn't use that long term without really you know, detrimental effects occurring. And uh, the other thing is. What's the reason for having a heavy lift vehicle? Because, you, like you said, you have to lift heavy things into space. Well, if you think from the other side of the coin, don't we just want to explore and figure out how to create these objects up in space initially? Because getting them from Earth orbit to the moon is going to be a, a fraction of the cost of getting it from Earth surface to the moon. Yeah, yeah. But that's what the space station's about, though. See, we have metallurgical experiments that have been done on the space station and again we're only in our infancy in space i mean we've only been here say f you know between 20 and 40,000 years in terms of our written history and we already see ways to violate the speed of light in space travel uh, that will probably be about 100 or more years away but that said we're on our way to a much more uh bright future um you know and i think that if we keep punching holes in our ecosystem with these big rockets that's thinking back in the 60s thought process where we just have to lift all this heavy stuff into space but we can actually start manufacturing stuff in space you know maybe we'll have like in star trek a space dock you know where ships are built in space this way your ships aren't constrained to be tubes you know, your ship can be any yes. shape at all any shape yeah yeah you know yeah, and I think that's a great idea. We're streamlining everything because it has to punch through the atmosphere at high speed to make orbit. Yeah, you know, it's and this, then it, it, you leave and this, go to the moon or whatever. Yeah, it's this getting off of the uh, um, the Earth, which is the problem. Um, that's it, right. It takes so much 
energy and effort just to get that, what, 100 miles into space? Um, and then the yeah. rest of it is relatively easy because once you've got out of a gravity, gravity well of Earth, you're, you're, you're pretty much done then. But obviously you've got to build things and get the things up there and before you can build your, your spaceport, and that's a few centuries away, I'd imagine. So, um, let's have a look. Uh, I watch Isaac Arthur. Uh, this is uh, Gusto 1000 Pound or 1000B. Uh, I watch Isaac Arthur in one of his videos. He proposes a giant tinfoil-like telescope uh, in low Earth orbit, which would be easy to launch, deploys, expands, and will be capable of uh, the precise current mirror telescopes. Yeah, so this is a, a, a giant telescope and like an inflatable telescope um, in being put up there. Uh, I yeah. think that's sort of been suggested before. Again, it's controlling the the, the optics of uh, the reflector, really, isn't it? Yeah, but you, know, you and I actually talked about this before we got on the air. We talked about uh, what we might have as a, a, a large-scale space-type telescope, you know, and we started by talking about it on the Earth, but then, um, you know, I had suggested maybe that would be built in orbit of a very fine material that was reflective, and then holding its shape isn't a problem because you just have to get it into the shape with struts or uh, membranes that have memory in them so they go to the right shape. Uh, all researched on Earth, but not fighting Earth's gravity. So now you can have a very delicate, massive, quote-unquote, mirror in a telescope in space that once you set it in its, in its orientation, nothing's going to change it. And so that's actually a very good idea. It's been on the table before. Uh, and I think that that is probably one of the things that eventually will uh, will get tried. Right, right. Okay, then. Um, Key Branch says, does the moon actually look bigger on the horizon rather when it is above? I've seen comments that it's actually identical and that it's uh, just an atmospheric uh, abnormality. Yeah, the um, you can do this with the sun as well. Um, the uh, the illusion that the moon is bigger on the horizon is due to the fact that you have something of reference that you have that has known size. Hard to believe, but if you actually look at the moon on the horizon and measure it uh, in any way you want, and then look at it when it's overhead, you're going to say, "Wait a minute, how could that possibly be the same size?" But it is, you know. And and so this is a problem of perspective. That is to say, uh, known objects that you see on the horizon that are helping you. Uh, view the moon so whenever you see something like that against a known object it's going to look a little bit bigger same thing with sunrise and sunset but but try the measurement yourself go outside and try it and you'll be you'll, you'll be astonished at the result right right okay then um we have one here uh from uh john ellis mark uh, do you do high quality photorealistic cgi renderings as part of your job does that make life easy to explain complex uh, concepts uh, yeah, actually, um, we've done a number of uh, television programs where we actually created uh, animations and things, um, mostly for naval stuff. We've, we've done things for programs that deal with Navy, and we do underwater submarine stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, this is something that has always been in, in fun for me to do, but it's also been something that I've tried very hard to get as good as I can. But... You know, I generally look at imagery and so forth that people send in, you know, sometimes hundreds of cases a month I get from around the world from people that are showing me, you know, this took this photo and look what showed up. It's this, it's that. But uh, sometimes what I've done is I've actually recreated what they've seen in CG to actually show them how something could have occurred, uh, like a technical illustration. But I do, I do a number of, uh, I do a lot of CG, yes. Right, right, okay then. Um, it's very important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Matterbeam says, um, how are some supercondoled infrared telescopes like the JS, JWST or the SAFAR spritzer reporting sensitivities in the 10 to the minus E20 watt um, with cosmic background radiation is a thousand times greater? So he's saying that the noise from the background radiation is more than these tiny amounts that they're picking up in the uh, infrared. How does that explain? Well, I don't. I don't actually uh, know the uh, the sensitivities of the James Webb Telescope at this point. I mean, once it's launched, uh, uh, the the ideal parameters always change a little bit. So uh, once it's there and in space, then we'll be able to do the comparison. But usually, there's a floor. There's a noise level floor, 
and that's sampled as a control and just removed. And what's left behind is that that, that signal. Um, so typically, it's a, a process to remove that. Um, and if they know how, if they know the mathematical uh, expectation of the data coming in or of the, or of the noise, then they can actually remove it mathematically or you know, that we, that we call procedurally uh, as well. But uh, until it's launched, we won't actually know uh, precisely what its on-orbit sensitivity is because it's affected by all kinds of things. And when it's on station, then and only then will we know what we're getting at that location in space uh, that needs to be dealt with. But once it's launched, I'll be happy to you know work that out. I'm going to actually work that out once we know. Right, right, okay. Um, Dragon Komorak, sorry if I can't spell your name right there, <laughs> pronounce it. Um, for those measurements um, uh, we were talking about probably coming back from the moon, is it possible that CO2 and other gases in the atmosphere change the speed of light and the change of measurement results? Does atmospheric gases slow down light enough to be uh, have an effect, basically, I think you're saying there? Okay, that the, the important the important word there is enough. Um, atmospheric interaction can cause all kinds of changes to the light. It can be absorbed into atmospheric atoms and then re-emitted, which is why we see blue sky. Okay, um, it can be highly energetic particles that uh, are trapped in the magnetic field and swirl down and then excite nitrogen atoms and oxygen atoms in the upper atmosphere and then get re-emitted. That's why we have Aurora Borealis, uh, Northern Lights and Southern Lights. Um, so as far as the speed of light goes, um, it's not slowed down enough to actually matter for most operations. Um, it might be uh, impeded uh, by the molecules such that we have to change what happens to light as it passes through these molecules. Um, it, the, the light, as I talked about the blue sky, the air, the light that comes in is, that is, it's shifted toward the red end of the spectrum because of the fact that uh, the blue components, those higher energy light particles, are absorbed and re-emitted happily by uh, the molecules in the atmosphere, uh, water vapor, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. And so we do have to correct the color a little bit. Uh, but as far as the speed, for most operations, that that's sort of uh, immaterial. We don't care uh, about it at that point. I mean, there are there are cases where they actually care, but uh, you know, light is the, the the speed limit of of light is our speed limit in the universe. You know, for normal processes. Yeah. So know. I think we're saying that it probably would make uh, some difference, but not enough to make a, a major difference. Unless it's something really, yeah. really uh, specific, um, if you were measuring over a yeah. huge amount of distance, uh, maybe. Oh, by by the way, this is totally off the subject. It's a total non sequitur, but uh, on your uh, on your stream title, you you had put my name as D A T O N I O. Oh, I do. Uh, and it was yeah, and I wrote that in a Skype message to you, just so you know. You, you put my ah. name on. Just you want to correct it later. Oh, it's okay. God. It's not a big deal. You know how many people call me Antonio or Dan Tonio? <laughs> My last name has been T O N I O in some places. Like wow, you know, I you, you, got sure that's you got it. Almost, oh, don't almost worry about it. You right. got it almost nearly right. And I, I totally <laughs> took you off course. I apologize, but while it was on my that's mind, right. I figured I better say it. It, it, it's something which happens to my name as well. If you look at mine, mine's Shilito. I mean, how many people spell that wrong? And immediately they say, Shil, yeah, we know where you're coming from. You're selling out. <laughs> I've heard that one that a million times, you, yes. I, I thought you had to deal with that, I'm sure, but I wasn't going to say it because yeah. it would have been those things where you say, geez, I've yeah. never heard that before. <sighs> yeah, no, I only heard it when I actually announced my name on the channel and said it's Shilito, and then people say, oh, yeah, you work for NASA, don't you? Yeah, sure. I wish, <laughs> I, I wish I did because they might pay me more. <laughs> oh, you know what? I got to tell you real quick here. Um, you remember James Oberg, who was a NASA spokesman for many years? He worked for NASA. Hmm. Um, I, I worked with Jim on a, a show on uh, for Netflix, and uh, we were working on this one. It was a, some uh, movie about uh, the moon, I think. And um, I wore a red shirt uh, for that particular show. It was actually cranberry color, but it kind of looked a little more red on the film. And uh, uh, Jim Jim called me because I had made a comment that said that this feature on the moon that they were saying was possibly alien, I was saying was just a, a silly crater. And here's why. I actually demonstrate. I'll just say. I show why. Um, showed him why. 
Um, and they chose to cut that out and just put me in saying, oh, wow, that looks interesting. You know, and it didn't say, but here's what it really is, right? And so uh, Jim called me and said, ha ha, he goes, you're the red shirt guy from Star Trek. You know, you're the one that always beams down and go, oh, I'm the red shirt. I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a funny, uh, a funny a thing that happens. A bit of creative, that... creative editing could make you look like you're saying something completely what you didn't say. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, exactly. you know, after this is done, I'll be amazed to see what you edit this into, you know. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it's going to stay pretty much as it is. I'm not going to do any editing in here. Um, no, actually, I trust you implicitly. You're, yeah. you're, you're no, a I'm good gonna, guy. I'm going to I'm gonna leave it pretty much as it is. It's, otherwise, it'd be yeah. too long. Um, you got a great channel and great subscribers. I think that, you know, you're doing a fantastic yes. job, and it's why I wanted to come out with you. I think this is great. Exactly. I so Thank love you what you do. Thank you very much, um, all the subscribers out there. Thank you very much for um, all you've done so far. Um, now, let's have a look at more uh, questions here. Uh, James Burns, would the camera on the rover... Uh, oh, is he... I think he's talking about the camera on rover Apollo 15 broke, where they couldn't capture the takeoff of the research. Yes, I think that one, um, the... The mechanism, the automatic. They couldn't the raise it. They couldn't raise it. it. It was jamming. It was going up and down, and, and it would sort of stick. And they decided that rather than actually try and follow the ascent capsule up, um, they would leave it in one position, and they sort of reversed yeah. it back, and that was it. Because otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do anything. With, they, they thought that if they got it jammed and it got stuck up in the air, they couldn't then pan around and look at the the rest of the the moon, which they wanted to do afterwards. Apollo, uh, I think, 16, they parked it too close to the uh, yeah. descent vehicle. So then when it then went up, it then went out of shot. And on Apollo 17, yeah. I think Gene Kranz, um, who was the commander at the time, said to Gene Cernan, uh, you're going to park that rover exactly where it is or don't come back. <laughs> 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 yeah. is, and, of course, they got the great footage of the thing ascending. He did, yes. That is, it. and of course, a lot of people say, "Well, how can anybody operate who, who the they camera leave behind? when there's no one there?" <laughs> well, of course, it was all done by uh, remote control, um, and it wasn't uh, in real time either. It had to be timed, so they had to allow for the delay. Uh, of getting the signal yep. there, and they knew how long it would take for the ascent module to go up, so they would time it and say, well, it took so many seconds for it to sort of follow it up, and we have to send that signal to, sit, to set the motor off. So they weren't tracking it with a joystick or anything like that. They sent the signal up um, a, a, a couple of seconds before to allow for the time delay difference, uh, and they got it just right, and off it went, and that was it. Yep. So um, that was a yes. beautiful shot, and I, I, when I was a kid, I always wondered, like, well, man, who was the poor guy they left behind? <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. It, but then obviously, I realized when they when they, when they did the remote that it was, uh, you know, not anyone left behind. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Um, we've got uh, John Ellis. Uh, how did gravity distortion or lack of there cause the Hubble to have problems after the launch? I don't think it was gravity distortion. That was just a, no, I, a bit of a balls up in the mirror manufacture. Yeah, it was a human error uh, in one of the components of the mirror. They actually, and it was actually Perkin Elmer here in Connecticut uh, that that was working on that. Uh, and uh, they, it was an issue of of uh, metric versus uh, you know the uh, inches. Basically, they had a, a a screw up in that arena, and and so when they were calculating the the uh, some value that was associated with that particular unit, uh, they did it in the wrong unit, and that ended up making Hubble look like it needed eyeglasses. So that's what they made. They made eyeglasses basically for Hubble and put those up on uh, in one of the other uh, space missions on the shuttle. Right. That, that's my understanding. I mean, I I, I didn't look at it too far because yeah, that's a failure I, I, that's been corrected. I did I did a video on that, and um, the information which I found was that they they made the optical. Um, testing equipment and there was two there's two ones ones was more accurate than the other um and because perkin elmer were the number one optics maker in the, the world at the time uh they decided to use only one of them and that was the one which had been miscalibrated uh the guys had set it up and they um they'd left uh an end cap on or something uh, and it was very fractionally out and 
that when they did actually check the thing um, with the second uh, uh, the secondary one, they they refused to accept the error. They said, well, that's not as accurate a measurement as our primary measurement system, so therefore it must be wrong. Um, and I think it sat there for four years in storage and various universities actually said that they wanted to test it and make sure it was okay. And they refused it each time. And then they sent the thing up into space and that was it. But there was another one made by Kodak, which was there and it's perfect. And it's still, it's in the museum somewhere now, I've forgotten where it is. Um, and that one is perfect. They could have just swapped that one over, put it in there, <coughs> and that would have been it. And it would have been fine. And we wouldn't have any of these issues. But it was, um, I think it was, uh, it was a bad communication between NASA, Perkin Elmer, um, the people inside the procedures, a whole load of things. I think the uh, yeah. one you were, you were referring to, the, um, uh, the calculation between imperial and metric was the lunar the, the mars orbiter the first one um where they sent the the thing off and well, they'd, ca they'd calculated the uh, the trajectory um uh, to the to mars in um inches uh, and then they were measuring it in metric system and then the two didn't line up and when they tried to then send uh, send the correct signals or what they thought were the correct signals to make it come into uh, the martian uh, descent um, orbit, it just crashed into Mars or into the atmosphere, and that was it. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. I do remember that. that was I think end. you're right about that. I see yeah. past failures. I try to ignore because I want to, you know, look only to the future that we're working on. You know, make sure we get it right moving forward. You know, but you're right. Yeah, yeah. I think but obviously, right it's it's learning from these past mistakes. You think, well, we're not going to make that that mistake again. Um, and it was a silly one because uh, I think it was, uh, was it Lockheed who made it. They, because they were an aerospace company, uh, they dealt primarily in, in Imperial, whereas the space business was dealing in metric, and that's where the two came from. Um, and it was, yeah. it was something very simple, but had a major impact on there. So next yep. question, um, Bruce Merrill, um, apart from the laser reflectors, how many, if any, of the ASLEP experiments are still returning data? If none, how long did they work for? And where, oh, where, yeah, I'll, and, I'll, Oh, Alcep, you mean? I think he he, Alcep, he, yeah. he missed. Yeah. Um, well, I think the Alcep uh, is is a it's a package. It's more than one. You know, it's the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments package. It's, it's got many uh, different experiments on it. Uh, and uh, I I can tell you, I think there is uh, a number uh, of packages on there. A number of things that uh, still worked. I mean, I think I know we had the uh, the uh, so the solar wind experiment on there, uh, and the ion detector that I think were were still uh, returning data. And I don't know how long. There's there's actually you can get those logs to actually they're they're online at NASA. You can actually go and look at the experimental logs for the data returned and see if there's any left. I mean, um, see if they're if they're actually just passive experiments, they have to have some kind of energy with which to send that back. All right, and the batteries, any batteries have long since been dead and or covered by, uh, you know, micrometeorite uh, impact dust that's thrown up and cover the solar panels, much like our, you know, the, uh, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers have a, a, you know, they need windshield wipers for those, those, those panels to wipe off the, uh, the dust, which eliminates a lot of the charge that they can be getting. So uh, they would have long since stopped working without any battery power. And the batteries, of course, wouldn't last forever anyway, even if they're being charged. So I'm not sure what the longevity is for the Alcep uh, package because they're a bunch of separate experiments. You know, right. I don't, I don't have that. Right. I must admit, it's I not something that. I actually know much about. Actually, the Alcep experiments. I know they'd left some behind, but I didn't actually know what they actually were. So I, know, I can't. Yeah, there's, that. there's a number. They've, they've got, like I said, the solar wind and the, uh, the ion detection experiments is there, um, and then there's a magnetometer uh, on board uh, and. Uh, Another one for, uh, 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 the, well, another one for heat flow type measurements. And so, but those things in, in are, are just, like I said, once they deploy those, they get these, these this data. But, you know, the ALSEP experiment didn't have the solar panels on it, you know, that I uh, could, that could tell. Uh, so it couldn't, it couldn't just keep rejuvenating any batteries. So anything on it, you know, it had to be uh, you know, short term. Yeah, right. 
Okay. A large Hadron Collider says, um, any talk of the Deep Space Gateway, could we use the parts of the ISS? Uh, well, I did that. For, uh, for a, what? For the ISS. Well, the ISS has been around for a long time, and that's old tech. The, the, uh, the Deep Space Gateway, or the LOPG, which is now, uh, we just did a video last week on that, um, that's completely new. Um, obviously, it's, uh, it's designed to work in deep space where we are not protected by the uh, magnetosphere. Um, so you've got more radiation in there. You've got to have better shielding. It's designed uh, completely differently with obviously now much more modern manufacturing techniques. And I think that th there will be, apart from the docking hatches, which I think are standard, that's about the only thing that will really sort of work from one to the other. Um, because I say the ISS is is quite old now. I mean, most of that is sort of getting on towards twenty years old, isn't it? Yeah, and and yeah, you know, the ISS is actually not going to be up in orbit forever. It's already no, you know, coming down. It, it it's going to be coming down maybe in the late twenty twenties, uh, twenty twenty eight yeah. maybe. Going to be a um, very expensive firework display. <laughs> it will be, but it will have given us a lot of data in the interim, and um, you know, maybe if we're lucky, it'll. You know, come in over the Atlantic so we can all see it. <laughs> yeah, I think you know? I think they said it was going to come in over Pacific, like the uh, Tiangong did, like the so, like the Tiangong did. Yeah, yeah, but for, so we won't see it, or we'll see something uh, on a, a camera somewhere. So, oh look, there goes one hundred and fifty billion. Well, actually, it'd be more than that by then. It probably yeah, right. about yeah. two hundred billion. But like you yeah, say, well, it's, 30, it's thirty years worth of use we've had out of it. So, eh, yeah, it's not too bad. No, um, not too bad. Yeah. So let's have a look. Um, how, uh, Peter S, uh, how many RTGs have been left on the moon? How many what? Worship. RTGs, uh, the, um, I'm assuming he's talking about the radio thermal generators, or radiographic, the uh, nuclear generators. Well, they've got them in the Zondas, the, uh, the Russian ones, they were nuclear powered. Um, I don't think any of the American uh, stuff uh, no, was, was it? We we didn't have any. I don't think we had any RTGs unless they were a top secret at the time. Um, uh, the Russian Zond, I believe, is powered by one. Right? You said that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's bec it was uh, because it was there. F uh, was it the Zond of a Lunar Hod? Lunar Hod one two. Uh, they had um, a heater in there, and it it basically blew. I don't you can't blow air around because um, there's no air to blow around. It's a vacuum, uh, but it. it kept the electronics warm when the sun went in basically yeah um and it would work for so long um and obviously generate its power but then it died after a while so well uh, i mean I it can radiate heat i mean radiating yes. heat it'd still be ir that would be absorbed by yeah. any other yeah. local nearby metal i'm just thing, thinking so. of, i'm thinking i'm just thinking of convection because they say yeah it, it, it's uh, it's yeah. obviously got to be radiated heat rather than convected heat because there's no unless they had a sealed atmosphere in there which i don't know whether they did or not um in there but i don't think the uh the the jade rabbit the chinese one i don't think that had um uh an rtg on it i think that was just batteries yeah that just it, because it didn't last long so it no. had to be just you know yeah you know, I think a that... battery uh powered and uh solar cell charged uh yeah. supplementary yeah i think that died of um lunar dust that one wasn't it yeah yeah, the dust yeah, got it, to it. it. Didn't, yeah, the dust was. Remember, even in the Apollo landers, the astronauts had dust on their 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 non-suited clothes when they took off their spacesuits. There was dust in the ventilation system. They had lunar dust all over their their hands and and so forth when they got out uh, the lunar uh, lander and got back to Earth. And that's why they're in quarantine, you know, yeah. because they were very much. Uh, it was very much concerned that there might be some kind of lunar you know, bugs Virus. that they would have brought back. Not, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Not bugs yeah. and like eh, crawling around, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Some, path, some pathogen that would uh, cause a problem on Earth. But you make it, I mean, they look like a coal miner sometimes when they, when they came back out. Um, they were covered yeah. in it. And they said because it's electrostatic, it sticks to you. You can't get rid of it. <laughs> That's right. And, and my, my, my uh, lunar soil that I created here for the, the, that What on Earth uh, show um, – Oh no, that was that was uh, NASA's unexplained files. Um, their soil that was actually 
very much like that. I mean, if if it got into the air, it ended up being statically connecting to you, and you just, every time you brushed it off, it would just come back and reattach. You know, whoosh, you know, and come back. Uh, so it was miserable stuff to work with, and I have a whole pile of it still in the shop uh, here because uh, we might use it again for other productions. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, just a few other so things it's, here. It's vicious stuff. Yeah, yeah, it is, yes. Um, it's not the sort of stuff... Because they say that you can't... Um, it doesn't wear down. There's nothing to... I suppose the nearest you've got to it is like volcanic uh, pumice, which comes out of a volcano. Uh, that's well, well, yeah, the, the nearest. The, the aerial, aerial bombardment. Aerial particles. Yeah. yeah, aerial particles uh, of molten material that that cool in the air and land is sort of like volcanic glass. They hit something, they shatter. Uh, mm. Just imagine that uh, trillions fold on the moon, and you know where the cooling takes place in vacuum, and you end up getting this this beautiful glass material of you know, gl lunar glass, and it gets pulverized into tiny little glass fragments. So. Uh, you know that was cutting through their spacesuits, as I said. You know, and, and yeah. uh, prevented their final space uh, moonwalk in at least one astronaut's case. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Can you give a rough estimate of when uh, reach various milestones in space colonization? Uh, well, that, that's one for you. I think, Mark. Yeah. When do you think a rough estimate of the milestones in space colonization? First moon base of Neil Cylinder Dyson Swarm. Um, I think that would going out some yeah, considerable Yeah, I'm, I'm glad distance, they didn't say Dyson Sphere because that would be probably never. A Dyson Swarm is more likely. Uh, and in fact, uh, dealing with Dyson Swarm, going you know, front, back to front on this one. A Dyson Swarm is initially what we thought Tabby Star might have had around it. Um, well, and Tabby Star is a star that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's over a thousand light years away and it's got uh, some evidence that it's been dimming over time up to 20% of its light. But it's looking like maybe that's being explainable uh, in other terms that are more natural uh, rather than a uh, alien-made uh, megastructure. I would have preferred the megastructure myself. But yeah, it's more interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But Dyson Swarm is actually a very good idea for, for power. And most likely, if we put up a, a, a fleet of satellites, and I say fleet, I mean maybe a million, maybe more uh, satellites that – Again, because of the, that number, they would have to be built in Earth orbit and then deployed. All right, They couldn't be launched from the Earth. Uh, even if you had a rocket that brought up 100 at a time, okay, you're still looking at many launches. okay. You're still looking at, at, at hundreds of thousands of launches to, just to get you know, a small number up there. So uh, that said, we would want to get a... Uh, uh, facility to build these in orbit and then deploy them in a way around the sun so that they can actually beam energy back to us. Now, what do I mean by beam energy? Well, the energy would probably be microwave, okay? And that would get beamed back to Earth orbit where it'd be collected and then steered down to the planet. There'd be loss all you know, along the way, uh, for sure. Uh, there might be beam divergence from where they are out in space and the beam divergence a little, maybe, maybe not. And then that would get directed down to a receiver on the Earth, all right? Um, a better way would be to actually achieve a space elevator where we can actually have an energy conduit going straight down to the ground right from a satellite. But you know what? That would be really difficult because the satellite that's beaming that energy to the space elevator would have to be at geosynchronous orbit location. Otherwise, it's spinning around the Earth, and the Earth is going very slowly underneath it. You know, So there's not many times when that thing will be over the tether, so to speak, to actually uh, be able to beam the energy through. So for continuous energy, it would probably be uh, low Earth orbiting satellites, a whole constellation. That's what we call a bunch of satellites yeah. in orbit of the same type, a whole constellation. And these would be beaming this microwave energy down from the microwave satellites that are sitting out there uh, at the sun collecting all this energy. All right. So the Dyson Swarm is a great concept, but there are practical limitations and, and so forth because so, if we're going to be going – yeah, go ahead. So, so when do we think – that sort of thing. I and mean, if we look at the first moon base, that's probably in the next 10, 15 years. Um, if Elon Musk has anything to do with it, it might be, uh, yeah. it might be within 10 to 15 years. If, if, uh, if Robert Bigelow has anything to do with it, it might be uh, you know, within the same amount of time. So I think we're probably going to have a moon base with a reasonable uh, you know, uh, contingent of, of scientists and, and personnel 
probably in the next 30 years. And now keep in mind, it's not the base itself that's the hard thing. It's getting there. See, we don't have a, a vehicle anymore to actually get us to the moon. That's what Orion is all about. That Orion project is supposed to get us to the moon and to Mars. You know, So we no longer have a lunar lander anymore. Okay, That's going to have to be redesigned. The lunar module has been retired. All the people that knew how to make it are gone. Um, and, and the it's technology is very old as well, isn't it? Yes. That's right. That's right. It, you know, you know, it was designed in the I 50s, mean, that was. <laughs> Yeah, and, and when you consider what was around for computers back then, I mean, even the shuttle used PDP-11 or PDP-10 computers, old, old computers, even then when the shuttle was flying. Okay, So let me tell you, it, it, the technology has moved quite along. And so uh, Dyson spheres, we're probably looking at you know 50 years minimum before we have tests up there. Uh, lunar base, probably 30 years on the outside. Um, and uh, presence in orbit, though, that's one that I think is important. A presence in orbit, manufacturing presence in orbit. That one might be 20 years because we can get to orbit pretty routinely. In fact, uh, the Russians are very good at launching and, and recovery. Um, and they can help anybody do this, and, and they will. Uh, and having industrial uh, you know, capabilities in orbit will give us the capability of building materials to get to the moon. Right. So we're going to go there first. We're going to go to make an orbital uh, manufacturing facility that will make stuff that goes to the moon. All right. Right. Then we get to the moon with that stuff. That stuff will be used to make stuff from the lunar uh, materials and resources available there. You know, yeah, and then it's a to, step to, outward to move. A, I think to, you're saying then O'Neill cylinder. What's an O'Neill cylinder? I haven't heard of that one before. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I haven't heard of that. No, no, it's obviously that's something a bit bigger. But then but Dyson Swarm, I mean, that is, that's going on into a long time into the future to be able to get to that way because just the yeah. orbital manufacturing of millions of satellites would take us yeah. probably hundred, hundreds of years to get there. Right, that's why I said on a, on a smaller scale, we could yeah. probably do that in about 50 years, have a few up there. I mean, if you think about it, that's kind of what SOHO is now. Uh, it's not an energy uh, yeah. you know, receiving satellite, but it is beaming you know, uh, the image information to us. So we have a template for getting into you know, uh, an orbit about the sun without right. uh, any problem. We can do that. So okay. it'll just be a myriad of period of time before we actually build an energy generating satellite that's around the sun. Yeah, great. Uh, we've got another super chat coming from Pretzi, um, 499. Thank you very much. Um, and he's saying, um, I saw a second shadow crest on the bottom half of a moon. What caused the extra shadow? When and where? <laughs> um, two months ago, I saw a second shadow crest on the bottom half of the moon. What was caused the extra shadow? A shadow crest. I don't know what that is. I, I mean, is he talking about like a, an area of elevated ground that looked like it was throwing a shadow? I don't um, know. That, that's all. That's all I've got here at the moment. So maybe, okay, okay. maybe we could uh, uh, elucidate a little bit more on that. Yeah. Um, we'll if he's, out. if he or she is listening, it can just yeah. you know tell us the rest of that, and we can figure it yeah, out. Yeah. Okay then. Um, uh, let's have a look. Uh, Right. Um, oh, we've got some uh, interesting one. Uh, Bruce Merrill, I'm curious as to what Mark uses the hook for in his background. Shot. <laughs> oh, oh. That. That's yeah. for hanging no, things that, on. <laughs> yeah, actually, no. That 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 hook. See, my my office is actually, uh, you know, uh, it's a. I hate to move my camera on you, but see this. Right. These are my my windows. Okay, that's real real portholes. Okay, oh, my office. You're in is a actually, ship. <laughs> exactly. This is a, a World War II uh, battleship, actually. That that uh, I'm I'm sitting in. I have a, a door over there. You can see the the door is a hatch. A World okay. War II battleship. Yeah. See that? Uh, what a, a now, real one or just a bit of one? Oh, oh, I didn't say real one, did I? <laughs> no, no. It's th a model. This is. Uh, it is uh, actually uh, my my whole office is actually a, like a movie set because when we film here. Ah. Um, you now the, the crews come out. They, I've got, you know, again moving the camera. Sorry, uh, I've got rivets on the walls. Uh, you know, I've got actually rust. You can see rust on the walls. I mean, it looks real just rust. like a real, real rust. But that's that's 
Actually, that is real rust, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, this it's only sheetrock. It's only uh, you know that sheetrock wall. But uh, I applied a solution, okay, being a bit of a little playful chemist. I applied a solution that was uh, an uh, iron-based solution, and they added a rusting solution to it to actually make real rust in the walls. It's a simulation because here in, uh, here in this office, uh, yeah, I figured if I'm going to work here all the time, uh, I want it to look like something that I can enjoy. So I made it a World War II battleship. It's a specific compartment on the ship. Uh, in fact, um, <laughs> so that's just the background there. Um, right. So it's, it's a nice little area. And the, the, right. Those I beams are actually wood, but you know it's all fake. It's, it's all fake. It's all done with uh, string and bits of uh, mirrors and string. <laughs> that's what it is. It, it, it makes you wonder, then, actually, why didn't you build the sh uh, the uh, the deck of the Enterprise or something like that? <laughs> I was actually uh, I was actually toying with actually making it a far future science fiction thing, uh, and having all kinds of lighting in here that was you know, subdued lighting that would actually add these really cool highlights and glows. Um, and I decided that since I do a lot of work for the U.S. Navy, um, that I would go on a naval theme. And so I picked the battleship. I visited one, took all kinds of photos, um, and so forth. And uh, I originally wanted to do a sub, but I, I've been on a nuclear sub, you know, at sea as a visitor for the Navy, and um, it's it's round, you know, the, 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 it's all round, and, you know, I, I didn't want to cut out the usable space in here by making a tubular yeah, section yeah. here, but that's it, you know, so it was a lot of fun, and uh, it's really exciting. So, right, you could have your own Philadelphia a crazy, experiment see? in there almost, couldn't you? <laughs> oh, I actually, um, on the entrance to my shop, I have a nod to the Philadelphia experiment. I actually took a section of my hand, made a, a life cast of it, and only the fingers are sticking out of the wood. Oh, so they're like, sticking, uh, it's, yeah, it's, so it's, like, it's sticking out. Yeah, it looks like yeah. something's stuck in there. <laughs> That's right. It does. It does, actually. That's funny. Um, right. My camera's well, on a wire, I would show you. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Well, I think we've come to the end of the questions now. Um, so, uh, let's see. Which we've got to pretty much the end there. So, uh, uh, I think um, I'd like to thank Mark for coming on here. If you want to get in contact with Mark, any any reason um, to speak to him about uh, any of the, the sort of things he gets up to, um, the links will be in the description. Um, they're in there now, but obviously when the live stream then goes proper it'll be in there and i'll also update that as well and, yep. and i think um you've got um uh some interesting uh things you do in the crater creation department haven't you yeah that, that's a little <laughs> crazy you know I, I never thought about you know how much data is really out there and in the lunar reconnaissance orbiter bring you know gets us some very high res data and one of the things i do with the data that's from the moon is I actually uh, take the data from the moon and I actually create 3D printed craters, all right? So this is an actual, you know, it's a 3D print of the, of the crater Copernicus on the moon. Right. And, you, you know, it really is quite accurate. And I brought this, uh, I was in Boise, Idaho uh, last week. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm all over the world this year. But this, this, this week I'm here. <laughs> and this is... Uh, Copernicus, it's it's uh, you know it's a 57 mile diameter, that's 93 kilometer uh, mile diameter crater, uh, and uh, it's got the ray structure and everything that that's painted, okay. But the actual data is very accurate, and and uh, we print these craters out. Um, is and it a 3D, they're 3D available. printer? That's a 3D print. In fact, that's it right there. You see it behind me. Oh okay. right. Uh, so yeah, that's it, it's yeah. Up, let's see, where is it? There it is. Yes, right just there. behind you there. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So, you, so yep. you take the data and then you um, create that. I think that uh, um, you have to amplify the, uh, the the X or the Z component to make them stand out a little bit more because otherwise they might be a bit flat otherwise. Well, in the, in the Lunar Highlands, that's, they don't have to do that, but uh, uh, on Mars especially, you do because as – cratery if it's such a word as mars looks it's really not that cratery it's actually flat um i have all the data for pluto as well we do pluto we do mars we do all, all of mars we have the swath of pluto that new horizons caught we have the entire moon um and we have parts of mercury we have ceres we have vesta uh we have ocular crater on ceres for instance which is the one that had that bright spots in the middle 
Um, and, uh, you know, people can come on and look at our online store, which is at our website there on the screen, um, fxmodels.com, and it's the FX store. Or we're found on Facebook at the FX Models Planetary Replicas site uh, on Facebook. And uh, there's a store there. And it's really, uh, you can come on board and see and then order any crater you want. You literally, if you don't know what crater you want, you could just say, I want this crater. And we'll go print it. And we'll make it at no extra cost. It's like a, you know, it's just adding to our library. We'll just go ahead and print it. Sure, why not? And, you know, and, and then how, we'll, we'll get how it much to do you. They, how much do they cost? Oh, the craters right now uh, online, they're, they're $39 a crater uh, for a, a plate. But uh, we're actually dropping that price uh, to uh, $25. That's American dollars, obviously. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so uh, it makes it a little more reasonable. And we have uh, standard, which is these guys, just the regular plate. Uh, and then we have these deluxe ones, which are actually on a wooden plaque with a brass plate. Right. Uh, and then the craters in the middle. Oh, it's very nice, yeah. Yeah, nice. And those are those are a little more expensive, but um, we've been selling those a lot. We've been selling uh, a lot of the crater plates, um, you know. And uh, I think it's a, a really uh, uh, a great endeavor, and 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 you know, we use it to actually uh, help keep doing what we do, you know, our research and stuff. Um, so you know, I work with as you as you know, I work with Douglas Trumbull, who is. Uh, one of the world's finest uh, special effects artists on the planet. You know, he's an Academy Award winner. He's done uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Blade Runner, and the list goes on and on. Um, and, uh, you know, Doug and I are, are actually building our own uh, device to capture aerial anomalies, which in the UFO world, because Mutual UFO Network is where I'm the chief photo and video analyst, well, UFO uh, anomalies are, you know, uh, always there people are saying oh they're there they're there they're here i know it okay well you know what if you know it then we have to show it and so if if they're going to be there then i'm going to try and show they're there and we're going to do it from a scientific basis if they're out there let's just find them and show it because our science is the only thing our capability is the only thing that's standing between being able to see them or not if that's the case so yeah. we're developing this this system with multiple instruments on a single platter as we call it and this you know, aerial anomaly detection system is going to be able to see anything that encroaches in our space within its purview. And they're linked together. There's a bunch of them that are going to be linked together uh, all over the world. And, and they'll contact our smartphones right in our pockets if they see anything. You know, so if instantly you see something. You get a text saying, we've landed. Do you know it's working? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I get a text saying, oh, I'm keeping this, you know, oh, hey, t t t this, this alien stole our unit. You know, but the worst, uh, we have to mount them on these poles because uh, they're originally, I wanted to put them on the ground or just low to the ground. But the last thing you want is to get a, a beautiful alert saying, okay, we had this device, it caught something, and it's huge. And you go into the camera and you see it's a coyote going to the bathroom on your unit, you know. Like the, <laughs> that would be the last thing you want to see. It's like, oh, wow, that's fantastic. Well, we got a coyote. <laughs> you know, and he's not alien, but he's close. Yeah. So yes, anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah, but, you know. Yeah, so yeah, check that out. Check it out at the store if you like, and um, you know, join our Sky Tour live stream uh, with Mark D'Antonio, which is on uh, YouTube. Um, those of you that like Curious Droid, I mean, I like Curious Droid too. I mean, it's a fantastic site, you know, and a lovely channel. You do great work, Paul. Um, Thank you very much. And uh, and absolutely, I mean, I can't 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 say anything bad about it. Um, so uh, I'd love to see you there on Sky Tour Radio as well on KGRA, uh, on KGRARadio.com. Every Sunday night at 9, uh, I have a show for an hour, uh, which is probably going to expand to two perhaps. Um, and we have very high ratings, actually. Uh, we're, we're very highly rated. So I'm very pleased, and I'd love to uh, see it all continue. Uh, and uh, I wish you the best too, Paul, with everything yes. you're doing because you do a great job. Thank you very much. Well, yes, well, hopefully oh, yeah. we'll, see, we'll be seeing more of you um, in the future and future shows um, because, obviously, I want this thing to be uh, an ongoing thing um, as well as, obviously, doing the normal videos. Um, this is doing something which is interactive and people can speak to us right here and now, so that, that makes a difference there. Yeah, but, I like that uh, a lot. Yeah, yeah. 
But uh, okay then, well, I think it's about time we wrapped up. It's now actually an hour and a half. I was only planning to go about an hour, but there you go. I, we get Didn't they tell you it was going to happen? Yeah, yeah, you get caught up in these things. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. That's okay. Um, yeah, it's one of those things. But uh, thank you very much, Mark, for for making it over and uh, spending sure. your valuable time with us. Um, and uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much to all our uh, subscribers out there and our Patreon um, subscribers, uh, our, our Patreons. Thank you very much for supporting us. And I would say follow the link now, but it's probably not here. Um, but... Uh, it's now time to wrap up. Uh, I'd like to thank our moderators as well. They'll be appearing in the credits after the show. Um, and that's pretty much it. They did a great it. job. Yes, they yeah, did. They, they did, did a, a very good job. They did a great, job. great yes. job. Yep, yep. So yeah. uh, um, that's all very good. So we can uh, look forward to having their presence amongst us quietly in the background uh, for the next yeah. time. Thank, thank you very much, guys, there. Um, and awesome. so really, uh, it just brings me to wrap up and say thanks very much for watching. And the usual, uh, subscribe thumbs up and share and i think we shall uh, leave you now with the end credits and goodbye <laughs>